Welcome to Village Church, everyone. Uh, my name is Finu, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Village. And uh, a welcome to all of you joining us from across our locations uh, and online. And if you are new with us, a special welcome to you. We are uh, jumping back into our series in 2 Corinthians. Uh, it's had a, uh, a great uh, series that we just wrapped up um, on lies. And so in case you missed it, you're watching online, uh, you can go back to our YouTube page and check it out. Uh, but we're going to jump back into 2 Corinthians. Today we're going to be in chapter 11. Uh, we're going to cover from verse 16 to verse 33. Before I get into that, uh, just a quick reminder for all of us. Uh, we had an incredible uh, vision and worship night uh, a few days ago here in the Lower Mainland. We had hundreds of people that gathered together to worship Jesus, uh, and we also got an opportunity to cast vision, Pastor Jeremy and myself, to talk about what God's been doing at Village Church across all of our locations uh, over the past year or so, and uh, the vision for where we're going and what, what this is going to look like for our church in the year ahead, in the years ahead. Also, there was a really important update on our new ministry center as well. So uh, in case you missed it, if you were in the, here in the Lower Mainland, you weren't able to make it, uh, or across all of our locations, or even online, if you call Village Church, you're home, uh, you're in a community group, you're connected to our church, uh, check your inbox. If you get emails from us, uh, you would have received uh, an email with a video link. Uh, so you get to watch that vision uh, portion of that evening and get uh, get, get up and become a part of what we're uh, doing here at our church and of course trusting Jesus uh, for what he wants to do in and through our church across our nation. So uh, with that, let's jump into uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11 and starting in verse 16. Uh, we are dealing with a, a church here in Corinth that has these intruders, these false apostles, if you will. Uh, in some points, uh, Paul sort of mocks them, calling them super apostles, and, and they're trying to take, take the church away uh, from the gospel. They're trying to take the church away from the, the message that Paul brought to them. And then part of this is, they're, the, how they're doing this is they're trying to discredit Paul's ministry. And they're basically saying, listen, Paul, like, like we don't actually believe that you're from God. And they're, and they're talking to the church about all these reasons why Paul wasn't really who he said he was. And, and Paul's concern is, if you discredit me and my ministry, you're going to discredit the message that I brought to you. And so uh, there's this whole uh, back and forth that's happening, and this is part of what Paul is addressing in this letter. And of course, part of how these guys are doing it, these, these false teachers are doing this, is uh, they're basically having sort of a comparison, a personality contest, if you will. They're comparing their skill sets, their history, their experiences, where they come from, uh, and all of those things, their credentials, if you will, their education against Paul's, and, and trying to make him look like he's inferior to them. And so the, the Corinthians, the church in Corinth, would not uh, follow uh, Paul's instructions but would be led astray by these individuals who are trying to take over the church. And it's interesting because, of course, this is part of the human condition. It's part of the, the human challenge that, that we are constantly thinking about ourselves in comparison to the world. We're constantly looking at how we view the world and how we view ourselves in comparison to the world. And, and you know, I, the other day I was, uh, I was thinking about this and I, uh, I, I had a conversation with my wife uh, uh, and uh, Trisha uh, had, uh, uh, had Lauren uh, go to school and uh, she she goes, she's in kindergarten, and uh, so they had uh, what they call twin day, okay? And in kindergarten, it's twin day, so basically you find a friend, and the two of you decide that you're going to dress similarly on that particular day. And so uh, Lauren and her friend, uh, they decide to, uh, to dress as Elsa and Anna, you know, Frozen, right? Uh, my, my kids are uh, addicted to Frozen, um, and so uh, let it go is like playing in my head even when I sleep, right? And so uh, she, she, she goes to school and, uh, you know, wears this princess dress and all this, and so when she gets home to she asks her, she says, hey, how did it go? What was it like? You know, did, 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 uh, uh, did your teacher say anything about your outfits and all this kind of stuff? And so Lauren goes, oh, yes, mommy, I, I, I know we looked really pretty. Like, everyone thought we looked really pretty. And, and so Trisha's like, really? H how do you know that? She says, well, mommy, you know, we were standing by a, a little cubbies, you know, where they put their lunch bag and all of that. We were standing by a little cubbies, her and her friend, who had, you know, dressed up together. And, 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 and mommy, when I looked across, she says, all the boys in my class were looking at me. And she said, mommy, they were speechless. <laughs> this is my five-year-old. Guys, pray for me. Trisha called me. She's like, get your gun permit right now. You're going to need it. 
right? That, like the idea that, that, that she, even at five, she's, she's comparing her beauty and her, how pretty she is and if the dress looks good based on how people around her are looking at her, how people around her are, are perceiving her. And this is sort of what's happening in the church. It's this personality context. These guys are trying to make themselves look better than Paul. And so what Paul does here is masterful, of course, because part of what he does is he says, well, I'm going to meet you where you're at. I'm going to actually talk about the things. I don't really want to talk about these things, but I will if that's what it's going to take to show the church that I have the credentials from the Lord, not from myself, but from the Lord to do the ministry he's called me to do. And so here's what he says. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool. Accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. What I'm saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come down to their level and I'm going to address them uh, based on what they're saying about themselves in comparison to me. And so part of this is this idea of the mastery of these people, the lordship of these people over the church in Corinth. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 25, Jesus addresses this. He talks about Christian leadership. He talks about what we should expect when it comes to leaders who are called to lead the church. Here's what he says in verse uh, 25. And he said to them, chapter 22 of Luke, verse 25. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Here's what Jesus is saying. This is the model of Christian leadership. This is the model of leadership in the kingdom of God. It's that we're not people that say we're going to lord over people. We're not leaders that say we're going to lord over people. We're actually going to be people that serve people. The, the more responsi responsibility you have in, the, in God's kingdom, the more you are a servant of the people around you. How to be a fool in Christian leadership. It's make it all about yourself. Make it all about your perception, your popularity, how people like you, how people applaud you. Make you the center of everything you do. Paul says that is foolish in leadership. I heard this humorous story um, of, um, of the Pope coming into New York and um, uh, he, he, he's doing a speech at the UN and this is not a true story, it's, it's just a funny story, so don't send me emails, please. Um, he, he comes into New York and he's going to speak at the UN. And so he gets into this car and uh, he, uh, the, the, he tells the driver, I'm late, I need to get to the UN to make this speech. So the driver's, you know, driving as fast as he possibly can, but the Pope wants him to go faster and faster. And he's, the guy basically says, listen, I can't do it because I've got two tickets already, I can't get a third ticket, I'll get a huge fine, it's just not gonna happen. So eventually he says, can you pull over? So the guy pulls over and, uh, and the Pope gets gets in the, in the driver's seat and the guy gets into the back seat and then the limo. And so there he's fast, speeding now 100 miles an hour. Of course, the cop car uh, passes a cop car. He sees uh, the cop car pulls out, you know, lights blazing, pulls them over. And the two officers, one of the guys goes up and uh, he says, you know, roll down your window. And so he rolls down his window. He looks at him and he's stunned and he turns around and he comes right, right back up and uh, to, his, uh, to, his, uh, to the other officer. And, and the other officer says, why didn't you give him a ticket? He did 100 miles an hour. He's like, I, I can't. And he says, who is it? Is it the mayor? He says, no. Is it the governor? No. Is it the president? No. Who is it? He's like, I don't know who it is. All I know is the Holy Father is his driver. Hey, that's how a lot of us think of God. We think of God, the, our Heavenly Father, as our driver. The one that is, uh, the one that does what we want Him to do. The one that, 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 that goes where we want Him to go. The one that leads us based on our desire. But the biblical narrative is that if we have uh, the right vision, if we have a vision of eternity, if we have an eternal perspective, then we're not going to care about how people perceive us in this world. We're not going to care about how people look at how, what we do and how we do it in this world. What will matter is in, that we will have an eternal perspective. We will have an eternal understanding of our works and the rewards we receive. 
You know, in the Roman Empire, the Greco-Roman world, there was no hope for glory in the afterlife. A part of their understanding was if you've got to receive any crowns, you've got to have it in this world. You've got to achieve in this world. And so they would uh, normally, as part of their uh, normative idea of, of culture, they would boast about their military accomplishments, their financial, economic accomplishments, and, and people would constantly talk about how great they were. Uh, in fact, uh, there's the uh, uh, res gestae of the Roman uh, Emperor Augustus, where basically he writes out all of his victories and all of the buildings he's built and all of the th things he's done in his life because that's the only hope he has of people celebrating him, people giving him a crown. But the Christian experience is completely different. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 7 says this, I have, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me on that day. And not only to me but also to all who have loved him his appearing. The antidote to self-glory is an eternal vision. Paul says, my, my crown isn't in this world. My crown is not, not the people that recognize me, appreciate me, uh, applaud for me. No, no. I've got a crown in heaven. Everything I do in this life is not for me today. It's for what Jesus will say to me when I get to heaven. That he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, in Christ, when he's talking about giving, he says, let your left hand not know what your right hand has done. This idea that, that we don't boast about the things we do for people around us because Jesus is the one that's watching and he is the ultimate one that gives us glory, that gives us uh, gratitude, that, that honors us for what we do. The verse um, 18 and 19, he says this, Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourself. Verse 20. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you. Here's what it basically means. I'll just go through this really quick. He's saying uh, they're, they're actually enslaving you. They're actually ordering you around. They're subjugating you. He says they devour you. One commentator says the idea is they eat you out of your home and your house. The idea that they're taking advantage of them financially. This is what they were doing. Or takes advantage of you or puts on airs. The Greek word, word there basically means you, they hold themselves up higher than everyone else. Or strikes you in the face. This isn't necessarily literal, it's metaphorical. That they're speaking to them in a way that's insulting. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak. He's speaking sarcastically here. He says, we were too weak to do any of this, to make you slaves, to devour your finances, to take advantage of you, to put up on airs of how great we were, or to strike you in the face metaphorically to insult you. That's, that's toxic leadership. Christian leadership is in 1 Peter 5 and 3 says this, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So Christian leadership is not domineering. It's the idea that you actually model what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Christian leaders are called to inspire. Listen, this is not just leadership in the church. If you're a Christian and you're a leader at work, you run a team, you own a business, you're in maybe government or you're in some kind of, of, of place of authority and leadership, the call of the Christian is you treat people in a way where they, they are inspired to live the way you live because of what you model. Verse 21, 22, but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. He says, I dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. See, he goes through the list of things that these guys are saying that they have over Paul. Are they Israelites? Are they part of the family of God? He says, so am I. Are they of the offspring of Abraham? Literally in the Greek, it's, are they of the seed of Abraham? He says, yes, I am too. I've got all of the credentials in the natural that they have. Verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. So now he goes, hey, listen, let's talk about being servants of Christ. He says, I'm even better than them. I'm talking like a madman. Here's why he's saying this. He's like, listen, I would never do this. This is not the Christian way. This is not how Christian leaders go. They're not, they don't just boast about themselves and how great they are. But he says, if you want me to give you my credentials, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you my credentials. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. He says, this is what makes me stand out. This is what makes me different from these guys. He says, I've actually suffered for the sake of Jesus. 
Like, like my credentials are that I've had great labors. In the Greek, the word is basically like you work all day and at the end of the day, you are exhausted and you literally like fall into your bed. You can't even hold yourself up. He says, I've, I've experienced multiple imprisonments. We know of one imprisonment uh, in the book of Acts where Paul and Silas are beaten up and they're put into the inner prison, right? In stocks and in chains. It was a terrible experience. And he says, that's happened to me many times. He says, with countless beatings. The Romans, that's what they would do. They would beat you up before they put you into prison. And often near death, meaning near death experiences. That's what I've had. That's what, that's what I have endured for the sake of Jesus. And you're right, when I was reading this, I thought about Paul standing in front of King Agrippa. There was this moment when Paul's being arrested. And they're asking him why uh, he believes in Jesus and to explain his faith. And he talks about the vision he had. He, he was heading from Jerusalem to Damascus, and he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And it transformed his life. Let me read a couple of verses from Acts 26. Here's what he says. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. He's saying, this is what I've done. All of the stuff I've gone through is because I wanted to be obedient to the vision from heaven. See, part of the call of the Christian is this, that we don't just expect to live lives of comfort, but we know there's going to be trials. We know there's going to be suffering. We know there's going to be difficult days ahead, yet we find strength because we are called by one who is greater than us and who empowers us to live every day victorious in spite of the struggles and the challenges we face. See, part of it is that Jesus suffered, right? He suffered socially. He was lonely. He was rejected. He was mocked. He suffered physically. He, he literally experienced the worst form of torture and death. You can imagine the Roman crucifixion. He, he suffered spiritually, literally disconnected from the Father, right? Like literally experiencing the ultimate rejection, the ultimate spiritual rejection. And yet, when you come to him, he says to you, I understand what's going on. See, the gods of this world, the gods of the religions basically say, when you go to them, they say to you, you better be good. But when you take your suffering to them, when you take your pain to them, when you take your disappointments to them, they don't, they don't understand it because they've never experienced hurt. They've never experienced death. They've never experienced suffering. But when you take all of that to Jesus, when you take your burdens to Jesus, he says, I know exactly what you mean. I understand exactly what you're experiencing. And my presence is is all you need to get you through, through this season. There was a, a, a poet, uh, Edward Shalito, that wrote a few words I want to read out. He says, The other gods were strong, but thou was weak. They rode, they rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. This idea that when you come to Jesus, he gives you a, a different framework of how to look at the sufferings, how to look at the challenges that you face in life. Dr. Martin Seligman uh, had this um, theory that he came up with uh, that, where he talked about this idea of explaining your experiences. Here's what he said. He says, your explanations are more important than your experiences. He talked about the explanatory style because he was, he was researching people that went through suffering, that went through pain, that went through tragedy. Two groups of people. One group, of, uh, group was like, were able to somehow overcome it and the other group was crushed by it. So what he said was, you know, part of it is not just the experience you go through, but how do you explain it? How do you find meaning through it? Uh, a few days ago, I was talking to a gentleman from our church who uh, recently gave his life to Christ. And, and by the way, can I just encourage all of us? Uh, guys, listen, when, on, the, on the vision night, we talked about this uh, a little bit. How many people, so many people in our church are coming to faith in Christ? It's incredible. And so a few days ago, this gentleman's telling me about how he came to faith in Christ. Um, he uh, had a really rough past, was going through a lot in his life, and you know, there was a, sort of a supernatural experience that he had, and he came to faith in Jesus, and he's baptized and stuff now. And then he talked to me about how after he came to faith in Christ, he had tragedy hit his life. Multiple things that were tragic happened. Three major things that were tragic, including the worst thing that ever happened to his business uh, for many years, uh, a personal tragedy in his family. And so he was going through all of this. And you know what he said? To, so I'm thinking as a pastor, he's going to be like, Pastor, why did God allow this? 
Because that's the question you typically get from people, right? And yet, you know his perspective? He says, Pastor, I am so glad I had found Jesus before these tragedies hit my life. He says, I, I don't know how I would have made it if I didn't have Christ with me through those seasons. So his experience was terrible, but the way he explained it through the lens of who Christ is was what gave him hope and endurance and strength to get through that season. Paul, speaking to the church in Philippi, says this in chapter 3 and verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in the sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul says, listen, I want to experience resurrection, but I also get that I have to participate in suffering. But here's what helps me. Regardless of, of suffering or resurrection, here's what I know. I want to press on. The word in the Greek is pound, to beat. It's the same word he uses earlier in Philippians when he talks about how he persecuted the church. He was beating up against the church. But now he says, once I've come to Christ, I am, I am working, I'm moving my life, all of me, all of my energy, all of my talent, all of my focus for the sake of the mission of Jesus. That's my focus. That's what I'm doing. That's where I'm going. Uh, Matthew 11 and 12 says this, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. This idea that part of being part of God's kingdom is that yes, you're going to have challenges. You're going to have suffering. You're going to have difficult days. And yet you take all of your experience, all of your pain, all of the stuff you go through and you move it towards the mission of God. I was talking to a young man the other day. He's talking to me about ministry and he's asking me, you know, how did you get into ministry and how did God use you and how are you doing the stuff you do and have traveled the world and all of these kinds of things. And I said, well, you know, um, it all started when I was 17 years old. It all started when I was sick in a bed that I wasn't sure I would ever get off of. It all started when I was broken. It all started in the worst suffering of my life where I remember my pastor telling me, Fanu, one day God, you will thank God for this. And I said to them, There's, it is impossible. I cannot imagine a scenario where I will thank God for the pain that I'm experiencing. And yet that's what God used. God used that. He used my experience. He used my suffering. He used the worst moments of my life for the sake of his mission. In Colossians 1.29, Paul says this, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. He powerfully works within me. See, that's the hope of the Christian gospel. That's the hope of the person who has a relationship with Jesus. It's that it's not your strength. It's not, it doesn't come from the inside. It comes externally to you. It comes from the outside. You're actually weak in your own strength. You're, you're, you, it's impossible for you to do the things God calls you to do. And yet you know you have a source that's not from, your, from within. It's a source that's external. It's a source that is the, the Spirit of God. It comes from the Lord. It's like when we were little, uh, we used to, in Bahrain, we used to watch this cartoon called Popeye the Sailor Man. You guys know what I'm talking about? Popeye the Sailor Man, he was in love with olive, you know, olive oil. And, and I don't know, I, at that time, I don't know, I just couldn't see what he saw in olive. But anyways, um, he... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Olive. Uh, anyways, you know, Bluto's like all, you know, in his business. And, and usually every episode is he gets like wiped out. He gets beaten up. Like Popeye's like just, he's useless. He's a weakling. There's no strength in this guy, right? And then from somewhere towards the end of the episode, I don't even know where he put it because it was a pretty big can of spinach, right? And he'd get the spinach and he'd put it in his mouth and man, his muscles will pop out, right? And he would give, you know, Bluto a, a, a right hand uppercut and the guy was done. It was like, it was incredible. And you watched that show and you knew always it was the spinach and not Popeye. If you ever attempted to think it's your own strength, you got to know it's the spirit of God, not your own ability. And that's what Paul's talking about. There's an energy that works within me that causes me that causes me to, to work and live my life a certain way. And listen, what is the greatest thing you can do with the energy of God? It's to seek Jesus. It's to know Jesus. It's to be in Jesus' presence. I love what he says, uh, Christ says in John 17, this is eternal life that you might know God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. That you might know God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That is eternal life. Why do we suffer? Why do you go through the struggles of life? Why do you, why do you persevere in the mission of God? Because when you think about the cross, when you think about who Christ is, you know, there's an old hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I want to read a few lines for you. 
when we survey the wondrous cross on which the Lord of glory died, our richest gain we count but loss and pour contempt on all our pride. His dying crimson from his head spreads o'er his body on the tree. To all the world then am I dead and all the world is dead to me. Were the whole realm of nature ours that were an offering far too small. Love that transcends our highest powers demands our heart, our life, our all. That's the call, that we give our life, our heart, our everything. When I think about our church, when I think about the mission of our church, I was just with our church in Calgary a week ago for a worship night that they were doing and talking to person after person after person of how Jesus brought them to himself and then to our site in Calgary and what God's doing there and the people that are coming to know Christ. Even at that worship night, there was a person that walked right off the street and tears rolling down her cheeks as she's in worship. And she said to me, I haven't been in church for so long. I've been wanting to get back to God. I just didn't know, know how. And she said, can I come to church? And we said, absolutely. And I found out from Pastor Michael in Calgary, she came back uh, the, on the Sunday. She had an incredible time. And she says, I want to keep coming back. Here's my point. Why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus do what he did? So that yes, we could know him and we could have him and we could, we could have transformation in our lives, but also that we would be part of his mission. This is what Paul talks about. Look at, look at what he says in verse 24, 25. Now he talks about all the persecution he went, went through. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of the anxiety of all the churches. Then he says, who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to fall and I'm not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. See, in our culture, this doesn't go together. It doesn't make sense. What do you mean boast in your weakness, man? You boast in your strengths. You boast in the things you're good at. You boast in the things that you're accomplishing. You boast in your victories, not in your failures. And yet Paul's um, perspective was so different. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in the next chapter, verse 10, he says this, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I, that doesn't make sense to us, does it? You know, in the 20th century, there was a psychologist, Alfred Adler. And Alfred Adler did this huge study, and, and he came up with this idea, this theory, he called it of compensation, the theory of compensation. He studied all these great people, and what he found was that, let's say, for instance, artists. He, when he surveyed artists, 70% of them had optical issues, and yet they were some of the greatest artists. And it was like, this doesn't make sense. How is that possible? And then he surveyed a bunch of musicians, and some of the greatest composers had problems with their hearing, had different, a, a different range of hearing issues, hearing problems. And he was like, how does this work? And here's what, what he ended up saying uh, at the end of his study. He was like, there's this idea of compensation. They compensate for the challenges they face. And his conclusion was this. Adler, Adler argued that the success they experienced was not in spite of those disadvantages, but because of them. They learned to leverage their weaknesses by cultivating compensatory skills compensatory skills. They came up with other skills that made, so as an artist, if you had optical issues, you saw the world differently. As a musician, as a composer, if you had hearing issues, you focused in such a way that you actually got, became a master in the thing that you did. And part of the understanding of the Christian uh, followership of Jesus is that our weaknesses actually make us strong. You know why? Because we compensate by going to God in the areas we feel we're, we're, we're terrible at. I tell people this all the time, and I know you won't believe me, but guys, I was the biggest introvert growing up. I could never talk. My wife refuses to believe this. And part of it is she wishes sometimes that that fanu would come back, just only when I'm home. 
Only when I'm home. At the church, she thinks I should definitely be talking, right? But because it's like, you know, it's like, you know you're like that. You know, that's impossible. Every time I come up to preach, I was just at a conference in Calgary, pastors from across Canada, you know, and I'm standing there and I'm like, what am I doing here? Why am I on this platform? Why am I on the stage? Why am I, why am I given this opportunity? Because on the inside, I still feel I can't talk. I'm not good at this. I don't know if people follow. I don't know if people are, are, are getting what I'm saying. I know I talk too fast, so obviously people are like, bro, slow down. I, I get that. So it's like, this is working. You know what you do? You compensate. You go to God's spirit. You say, God, I can't do this. I can't. I don't have the strength. I don't have the intelligence. I don't have the social skills. I don't have the financial ability to do the things you call me to, you're calling me to do. Here's what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to compensate with the Spirit of God. Suffering is a part of the Christian experience. Suffering was a part of the church growth in the early church. Roman historian Tacitus, talking about how Nero fastened the guilt of the great fire of Rome on the Christian, says this, he inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate and a most mischievous superstition that checked for the moment, thus checked for the moment, again broke out only in Judea, the first source of the evil. But even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and became, become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted. Not so much the crime of setting fire to the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to, uh, to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero often up his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even, listen to this, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. That was the early church. And yet one historian says this, listen to this, the reason Christianity succeeded over dozens of other religions was because Christians died better than anybody. They died the best. That's the reason their religion did the best. They died forgiving their executioners. They died with joy. They died singing. Nobody died like they died. Nobody dealt with torment, with the death, with the persecutions, the way they did. There's even this incredible phrase that comes down from this era that Tertullian says, blood, the blood of Christians is seed. The blood of Christians is seed. One of the church fathers, uh, Jerome, says this. He said, persecutions have made the church of Christ grow. Martyrdoms have crowned it. That was the early church. That was the growth, was the persecutions, was the tortures, was the deaths. Because they compensated. They said, God, we're so weak. We're the lowest caste of society. If you don't show up, and every time someone died, God's spirit began to move in that area. Every time the blood of martyrs was shed, the spirit of God began to move and reach more people. Tim Keller says this, while other worldviews lead us to sit in the midst of life's joys, foreseeing the coming sorrows, Christianity empowers, empowers its people to sit in the midst of this world's sorrows, tasting the coming joy. And finally, verse 32 and verse 33. Paul wraps this section up, chapter 11, and says this. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. And he says, but, was let, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. You almost wonder, why is Paul talking about this? And part of the reason I think he's talking about it is this idea uh, that they had in, in the Roman Empire for soldiers. The corona moralis was this crown that was given to soldiers. You had to be at least a centurion to get this award. And they would give you this award if you were the first one to climb up a wall. It was this competition they had. And so, so that was regarded highly in society. If you could scale walls the fastest, man, you were recognized. You were celebrated. People applauded you. They were like, that's awesome. Paul says, I didn't scale up a wall for Jesus. I was dropped down in a basket. I experienced 
the opposite of what society celebrates for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of his mission. Because I love Christ, I was willing to be dropped so that Jesus could be lifted. Here's the question, and maybe it's a hard message for some of us who are followers of Jesus. Are you willing to be lowered so Christ can be exalted? Are you willing to give up what is rightfully yours for the sake of more people hearing who Jesus is? When we talk at our church about vision and mission and, and where we're going and what God's doing, it sounds exciting, but it means sacrifice. It means giving up the things you rightfully want. It means that you have to part with your time, part with your talent, part with your treasure. It means you have to talk to people maybe you're not comfortable talking to. It means you have to start up conversations when you don't rather not talk to anyone. It means you're, you're out there. You put yourself out there for the sake of Jesus' name being glorified. Joseph Son, who's a Romanian pastor, persecuted heavily for his work for Christ, says this, Christ's cross was for propitiation. Ours is for propagation. When, um, when we lost our, our baby um, a few years ago, part of what happened was um, the doctor came into the room, you know, 22 weeks, we were 20, Trisha was 22 weeks pregnant, and basically said, you know, you're fully dilated and baby's going to come and you can't do anything about it. And, um, you know, we were as parents, of course, we said, doctor, is there anything we can do? Is there anything we can try? And she said, you know, typically we would do something called the, put the mother in the Trendelenburg position, which is like head down, feet in the air. But in your case, she says, there's no point of doing it because you're fully dilated. You're going to go into labor. The baby's going to come. The baby's not going to survive the, the birthing process. And so I was processing as a man, logical, rational, you know, trying to think through this. And um, so I turned to my wife to say, babe, I don't think you should even consider this because they, he was, she was explaining how difficult it is to stay in that position for it could be days, weeks, just depending, right? Um, and so um, I was going to say that to her. But as I looked at my wife's face, I knew what she was going to say. She had this determined look on her face. She looked at the doctor and she says, we're going to do that. And I was like, are you sure? Do you want to really put your body through that? Do you really want to go through all of that? And who knows if this is even going to work? The doctor says it won't work. And so for the next two and a half days, Trisha lay in that position. It's very difficult to watch her do it. It's very difficult on your body, especially with everything else that she was going through. To just, yeah, to me, it felt like the worst suffering. And she would cry constantly, especially at night, because it was so painful. Her legs were hurting and all her back was hurting. But she did it. And of course, two and a half days later, she went into labor, the baby came, didn't make it. We buried her. You know, I thought about it later. Not once in the last, I don't know, four or five years now since that happened, did my wife ever say, you know, I shouldn't have done that. What was the point? It didn't work. It was pointless. It was useless. I went through all that suffering, didn't have the baby anyway. Never said that. Because in her mind, what she did was not for results. What she did was for love. And when you do something for love, you hope for the best result. But you don't regret it if you don't get the result you wanted. Because you're satisfied that your love was expressed in the most authentic, genuine way you could have expressed it. That's what Paul's doing here. Paul's basically saying, listen, I don't know what's going to happen with my life. After Paul writes this, about 10 years later, he's executed for his faith. But he says this. He says, as long as I have life, because of the love of the one who loved me first, I will love him with everything I have. And the call today for everyone who's a follower of Jesus is will you love Christ? through suffering, through persecution, through personal pain and sacrifice for the sake of his mission, for the sake of his love, for the sake of his love impacting the lives of those around you so that they too can experience the love of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, 
would you help us to be men and women who are followers of you, who love you so much that we will do what we do, not for fame, not for accolades, not for applause, but for the sake of love. That if it takes persecution, that if it takes pain, if it takes sacrifice in our time, in our talent, in our treasure, that in the conveniences and comforts of life, that we would give it all to you and trust you fully. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us this Sunday. We hope you had an incredible time in our service. Today's sermon was amazing. We believe that the word of God actually can breathe life into, into your circumstances, into your situation, whatever you are going through, the word of God has something to say to you. And we hope it's been an encouragement for you this morning. Hey, if you are in the area, if you are near Vancouver, Langley South, or down in Alder Grove, Surrey, in the greater Vancouver area, we really want to encourage you to actually make your next step into getting involved in a community group. That is really where discipleship happens. So if you're thinking about how can I get more involved, how can I make my next step with Jesus, it really happens in community groups. So if you'd like more information, you can find out on our website and we love to get you plugged in with the right group so you can actually do life with other people as you pursue Jesus within community. Hope you enjoyed this service and we'll see you back next Sunday.